Thank you. You're about to see the fastest talk ever. Um, Alex did it yesterday about five minutes. Yeah. You wait for three minutes because, in fact, what you've got to say, what you're talking about, is actually much more important than what I'm going to say. So, <laughs> um, absolutely true. Um, where are we? Right, let's, let's go. Right, first one, um, bridging the gap. That's a lot of things that's being said. Beautiful Norman Foster Bridge. That's what you're expecting. I'm going to straight across this gorgeous sort of, oh, I come out of academia from my Arabic power into my teaching job, where I become a supervisor. What? You can become a supervisor? For I, I was a supervisor on um, a two week excavation in Cyprus. It was bloody marvellous. Um, learn how to drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're not going to get. You know, why, you have to ask yourself that question. Why am I not getting that? I mean, it's like you were saying about, uh, should I be expected to come out of university? Yes, you should. Yes, you should. If you're going on a fieldwork course, why are you not getting the skills? Why not? Why? So, get them. So, moving on. There's the gap. There's the beautiful place um, of commercial archaeology. I'm going to just talk about commercial archaeology. I have no idea about academic archaeology. I have difficulty writing my name, let alone an article. So what skills do you need? What do you know what skills an employer wants from you? Has anyone told you? <laughs> I'm moving about too much, aren't I? Yeah, you are. I'll, start, I'll stay here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Nobody tells you. That is one of the big things that we're going to have to get to universities, to let them know what it is you need. What qualifications? The master's degree, yes, for a supervisor, for a project officer. The ability to string a sentence together. The ability to write a report. Brilliant. However, the ability to stand in the middle of a muddy field, in the middle of winter, up to your knees in mud, which I did a couple of weeks ago, and record in a howling gale on a context record sheet, something sensible, that's what you need to be able to do. I also have to be able to get there. So this thing called, it's right, it's called a driving license, which is slightly more important than your degree at that precise moment in time. And this thing called a CSCS card, which I'm glad you reminded me, I've got to replace it. Um, it's run out uh, next year. These are the things that the units want to see. CSCS card, driving license, ability to shift a pile of, I won't swear, beep, from there to there, carefully, but quickly, because you see that developer over there with his little face pressed against the window? <laughs> he does not care about the little sooty layer. He doesn't actually care about that. He doesn't care whether it's uh, the demographic or the population of the Romano-British excavate. I don't care. I want it from there, over there, as fast as possible. And I would actually prefer it if you didn't dig it at all. So could you actually move the foundations that way? So you're having to get yourself in a completely different mindset from a research idea to a commercial idea. There's nothing to be stopped you being taught that at university. I'm looking up at, uh, at Tom and Alex there and we did that in about half a day, taught the concepts and the process of commercial archaeology. This, I was actually going to do my Star Wars sort of um, Yoda type thing, but uh, no, who was it again? Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan, this is not the career you're looking for. <laughs> That's not the bridge. Remember the beautiful Norman Foster Bridge? That's the reality at this precise moment in time. In a way, we have to sort of go, it is nobody's fault. It just is. That's the bridge between university and your career in archaeology. It's a bit wobbly, but we are here. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Amanda. Um, are you looking into the yes, <laughs> well, We are here to actually help that transition, to make the Norman Foster Bridge out of that hideously wobbly bridge, which I can tell you I, I wouldn't cross. You have a bleak future ahead of you, absolutely. In fact, um, according to some of the statistics from Mr. Numbers, Dubrock Numbers, is um, if I'm right in thinking, you can tell me if I'm wrong, which you often do. Say we've got 100 students leave university. Only about 15, 20 go into actual commercial archaeology. Yeah. yeah, by the end of that first year, only maybe 5, 10 are left. Why is that? The actual number of archaeologists that we need way exceeds that. At this precise moment, as I speak, and I don't want you to all just suddenly r sort of jump up and rush out and go to the computer, there's about 250, 250 archaeological digging jobs available. London, they need 70 archaeologists just now. But then they just got another effort up. They need another 40 archaeologists. PCA need 20 archaeologists. Headland need 
archaeologists at the moment. Um, Cotswolds need more archaeologists. They need them. So they're there. The jobs are there. So it's not, it's not bleak, but you have to have the skills that they want. Is there a way? I thought this, this is a bit sort of... Um, I was going to go, oh, um, uh, what's that, jazz hands, no. Um, Billy Graham, that was it. There is a way, my friends, there is a way. <laughs> You've got to be able to record what it is. And it's like you were talking about, there's um, a skills passport from Manchester, from here. There it is. There's another skills passport, which takes you to the early career. Where can I get this, I hear you say? Archaeologyskills.co.uk <laughs> Um, or, be because you've, uh, there you go, there's your one. Hey, I couldn't find it online. I there you go. <laughs> I've been holding back a bit from that. Um, I'm looking at Robin, scared. I was going to say something lovely about national occupational standards and how I didn't understand any of it, but I wouldn't. These are the core skills. I've actually spent my time driving um, up and down across Britain. I should have done it in a, a little Morris Minor. Driving to the units, asking them, asking the contractors, what do they want? What do you want? And these are the skills that they want. They want to know, can you excavate a, and uh, record a section? Can you fill out a context record sheet? Can you take a photograph? Can you lay out a trench? These are the basic skills that they want. And believe it or not, the commercial units have said that is what they will accept as a baseline. If you can do that, then you've got a job. But now they've got something to say that will move you from trainee to fully qualified, what they call qualified archaeologists, or capable of doing these tasks. They're going to now accept that. Um, I've still got a few more units to go to, but there is a way, my friends, oh yes, there is. It's called <laughs> the Archaeology Skills Passport. <coughs> Other skills passports are available. <laughs> I told you I was going to rattle through this. How am I doing? I've not beaten you, have I? <sighs> You have to remember what it's for. What are you doing archaeology for? There is nothing wrong with being an academic. <laughs> it pays more for the start. There's nothing wrong with being an arche academic. You've got to just realize where you're going. Even pottery specialists are, <laughs> are lovely people too. <laughs> but how are you going to achieve that goal? What is your pathway? Do not think there's one route to get to where you're going to go. There's not one solution that's going to fit each one of you. If you want to get into commercial archaeology, then it is up to you to find out how that happens. However, it's also up to the university to allow you the opportunity to find out how to do that. Commercial units and universities working together. What, a, what an amazing idea. As you said, they're already doing that in Sheffield at Wessex. There's four placements um, happening just now. Uh, including two additional ones uh, for people who have not got degrees. Cotswolds are doing the same at this precise moment as well, where they have a vocational uh, pathway into doing archaeology. I am, believe it or not, I have no degree in archaeology. But look at me now. Yes. <laughs> so there, are, there should be all these different routes and pathways that you should go. There should be a way for a specialist to follow that route. There should be a way for an academic to follow that route. But if you're going to get involved in, our, in commercial archaeology, you're going to have to learn what it is to be a commercial archaeologist. And so therefore, in a way, the university has a duty to you, as a person who's paying them quite a lot of money to get a degree, to at least give you the opportunity to learn what these skills are. The units as well, the contractors, have a duty, if they want to have a skilled workforce, to provide the opportunity to give you these um, skills that they're requiring as well, via um, perhaps placements. Even if it's a six weeks placements, um, two months placements, you're not going to get uh, abused. I'll keep an eye on that. You can get paid, but you'll get paid a trainee rate. Why not? Apprenticeships, why not? I think that's the way that you were saying, Amanda, that, you know, the, the, the CIFA are going. Mm -hmm. And that is the way that we should be going. Actually, all working together to ensure that we're all a skilled, happy, fabulous workforce. And um, so, because I wanted to actually uh, get more talk going, and uh, I'll, I'll shut up just now, and just leave you with, uh, oh no, I've left links and thanks. These are the links, and that's the thanks. <laughs> Well 
done. I did it for you. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't even have to hold up the song. Um, yes, thank you very much for that talk, David. Um, are there any questions on David's presentation just before we launch ourselves into the discussion? Don't worry, that will come. Yeah. If our question is more like a contribution. Okay. Um, I'm a second draft uh, uh, What I see even you know, with like my name is like everyone is uh, okay, they're doing their essays, uh, they're doing like to get the, the mark right and everything. And when they finish, they expect like an archaeology job for them to do. Uh, so like my contribution is like we actually as students need to be proactive in finding the experience. Like, okay, I understand that the university has to sort of uh, sponsor and help us to find it, but literally, uh, Google. Uh, <laughs> I would like an internship this summer, and I literally Googled it, and I'm just browsing through. So I really feel like we as students, we actually have to suggest even to the university and tell them we would like to do this to gain this. And yeah, if anyone wants their archaeology the red passport, I'm not going to use you're absolutely right, and it, that is, if I have one bugbear against students, God bless you all, is a couple of weeks ago offered some students from a university which will remain nameless the chance to excavate with me for a whole day, for free, and training. Guess how many students managed to get themselves out of bed on a Sunday morning? Zero. Nobody. They're, and it is it's exactly what you're saying, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's like, if you make the effort, it'll pay off. So yeah. Question. I'm graduated from 1977. <laughs> Did you get over the first? first? No. Ah. <laughs> I, and nobody had got the first in the first 10 years of Southampton University. The next year, some of the upstarts called Mike Parker Pearson and Tim Darvill were the first. <laughs> so we were, we were robbed. Um, however, um, by the time I'd gone to university, I had used my initiative because I knew I wanted to be an archaeologist and I'd dug in the summers and, and worked my way into excavations and there wasn't Google then, but you, you could do it. We used the, the CBA's calendar of excavations um, and that's how I became a professional archaeologist. I used my initiative. I had to more or less work my way through university because my dad wouldn't fund me because he said archaeology isn't a proper job and you'll never get a career out of it. And of course the only reason I've done that is to prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, you know, things haven't actually changed. If you want to be an archaeologist, then put your back into it, find the opportunities, make the opportunities yourself. And if, if anything's failing, it's that that message isn't getting across to people before they start their archaeology degrees. Archaeology degrees are brilliant for lots of other things. And archaeologists actually make brilliant managers and, and uh, have all sorts of transferable skills that are fantastic for, for taking you in other directions. But if you want to be an archaeologist, it's going to be hard. It's always been hard. It's never changed. And you just need to persevere and find your own opportunities. Um, I think uh, most of the students I teach who want careers in archaeology are finding their, their way into careers in archaeology. For those who aren't sure what to do and aren't drawn towards a career in archaeology, do you think I can, in good, in good, in good, in good conscience, point them towards a career in archaeology? Yes. There's no, there's no problem. I mean, there's two, in a way, two kind of points. One that's um, not what you asked, but I'm going to answer anyway, is somebody was saying to me on Badger, on the Badger Facebook page, how do I get, how do I find a job in archaeology? To which I was, <laughs> <laughs> this is a trick question. <laughs> but yes, there are ways that you can get a career in archaeology at this precise moment in time, in commercial archaeology. Is that what you mean? I'm not saying that they can't get jobs. I'm saying if you just take it on the £27,000 of a debt, can I, in good conscience, point it towards a career in archaeology? Yeah, because they won't have to pay it back. Yeah, won't make yeah. enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, apart from that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's basically it, yeah. I'd, um, I'd like to go back to a point, and I have to say I'm not an archaeologist, so you can all shoot me down. <laughs> um, but that lady up there, um, which you said, if I'm correct in accepting what you said, that um, some commercial firms will take on students from certain universities 
because they know the level of skill. I think in, I think there's an informal. I I was an employer before I worked at the <laughs> the IFA. Is it now is at Birmingham University, and we used to run. Uh, we used to take placement sandwich course students from Bradford, and we ended up employing an awful lot of them because we knew the kind of skills that they had from their course, and we knew that we trained them in the year doing a sandwich course, and then they came back to work for us later. And I and I suspect I don't know this, and this is completely informal. I suspect it's the case that in other commercial uh, organisations that they have similar relationships with other type. Yeah, my, my, con my concern with that would be that in, in some way this particular university has, its curriculum has been affected mm. by the, by, com by commercialism, you know, the, by the fact that it's a, a professional organization that wants, that wants skills, it will somehow begin to affect the university curriculum. And that's been the case. that to me seems, seems yeah. sort of slightly... Mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, again, completely informally, and I don't have any research to back this up, but I don't think I can think of a circumstance where that it's gone in the other way. That people, I think that's the problem in a way, that there isn't that much of a conversation in a two-way um, exchange of knowledge <laughs> between the uh, university departments. It's not a, uh, those sorts of links are purely, they're almost like personal links because you know you've met the individuals and you've worked with them. It's not because you have a memorandum of understanding between an organisation and a university department. I, that wasn't what I was implying at all. It's more you feel comfortable in that situation. You know what those students have probably learned and you know how much field work experience they've had in their course. That's, that's, that's all really. It's the same difference Yeah, just a comment on stats. So I do track jobs and postings and stuff as part of my research stuff. We are in the middle of a massive boom that archaeology probably has not seen ever. More jobs have been put up in the last year than what we've been able to track since 1993. We, so certain areas are not doing as well. There's not a boom in academic jobs and council units are still being cut. But in terms of commercial, we lost about a third of jobs across all of archaeology during the recession. And we probably in the last year added about a thousand. Easily, and that's that's being conservative. We may be back to what we were before the recession. Um, it's five years. Lots of applying applications are hitting their sunset clause. There is more work than there are archaeologists. And I would add to any of the students in here. Um, there's a term that hasn't been used in about five years. It's called the digger circuit. <laughs> and the idea is that actually, if you do commercial archaeology and you start out, you need to think about moving. And most jobs will give you away allowances and, you know, they'll pay for a place to go. And, and this seems to be a, a concept that's completely disappeared from commercial archaeology. But at one point, it used to be, if you wanted to do commercial archaeology, you had to make the understanding that you needed to move. And move often. So you'd go do a job for two weeks in York, you know, a month in Glasgow. And you did that for a couple of years or a couple of months. And you got enough experience so you can get a more permanent job. But I've seen so many people when they say they can't get jobs, I'm like, well, where are you applying? They're like, I apply to everyone in wherever the town is. If there's no work in that town, yeah, they're not going to get a job. But there's jobs everywhere else. And if you really want a job, I mean, everyone is desperate. Scotland for a while there, um, I, I basically was handing out jobs to people I knew because it was, do you know anyone? We are desperate for jobs. Anyone at all. Um, so, like, Tom right there. You just, I just called up Tom. I was like, hey, Tom. I know school desperate. starts in two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. We actually worked part-time. We switched off a position where Tom was in school. They were that desperate. They were willing to let me work two days. Tom, three days. They were that desperate. They were willing to work with us so we could do part-time bigger work. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you've ever done that, that is so rare. They're bikes. What? Are you telling the unemployed to get on their bikes? Even though history of that. Cultural reference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just a, sorry. So that's, but that's the thing about the thing, the digger circuit is you find the positions you call. So most advertisement when they say we're looking for archaeologists, they're not looking for archaeologists at their home office. They're looking for archaeologists and projects everywhere. Um, and usually a lot of those will come with per diem and travel costs. That's been cut a lot since the, since the recession. There's a lot less 
um, jobs now where you get an away allowance and a lot less, and a lot less jobs come as accommodation as well. I know. We'll be coming in the sort of the new, the new exciting badger where. <laughs> Um, sort of multicolour badger, which, yeah. um, but there's a compare the companies. I'm actually getting the companies to put down all the other things that they actually provide. That's brilliant. That that that, that will really. Help. Then they'll be able to match. You'll be able to match it, and they'll be saying, "Oh my God, 15 quid." They're now starting to say as a sort of a standard um, per yeah, diem. Accommodation is important. But during the recession, though, so, you oh. know, you would not get away allowances. You would not get anything like that. But now, now's the time, as you say. Now, yeah, now's the time. And ask. I mean, there's there's so many jobs out there. Yes, you might have to go halfway around the country but yeah I mean, I mean i've sort of been there done that i'm now working uh, in, a, in a sort of stable position so but i was trying i graduated um like literally at the start of the recession so i i did all that i did all the, the running around and stuff but it's very difficult to find stuff with with a way now compared to sort of in the early 2000s this person's not kind of quite well, I'll let her speak. Beyond, beyond the point of saying or worrying kind of. I was just one thing, just back to the question with them, between Amanda and this lady here. I used to work for Oxford Archaeology uh, for a good 10 years, and Oxford had quite a well established relationship with the University of Reading that they would take, partly because geographically they were quite close, and also that a lot of Oxford staff and had, had already come, so you end up in a cycle that way. It's people who work. <coughs> so you'd always get an annual sort of group of people who made who, who were up to standard who would sort of annually come from um, uh, Reading to Oxford Archaeology, the Silchers. Oh, um, he would always come come that way, and obviously still just sort of wound down a bit. It's still kind of going in its current form. But I'm now at the University of Bristol, and I've been talking with Oxford with, with all, all colleagues of mine, trying to get um, managers over to talk to our students about um, the real world of commercial archaeology, because we answer as many questions. I, I also supervise the Bristol Dig Barclay project, and um, I. I've, with my commercial experience and my colleague's commercial experience, um, Sean Thomas, uh, we've pretty much given them a quite a, rea a harsh slap in the face bit of a reality. Uh, if you miss that bus, you are, you are repeating that day. Um, and it, it's all about teamwork and there's no lounging around. And <laughs> because it, cause there's 50, 60 people on site and you know what I mean? It's kind of like, and after a few days, they get into swing a bit and certainly by the time they come back in the second year, everyone's behaving. So, um, so you know what I mean, and it's, it's that kind of thing. I've actually helped quite a few then, of those students this year, about five or six, I've helped by giving them references, and they've got jobs in commercial, and they don't have six months com um, commercial experience. I'm on their way near like that. But I said, just go, go ahead. Some got the Oxford um, graduate training positions. Mm -hmm. Other ones are going for, for just jobs. And I just, just stick in your CV. You just do not know who's, who it is that day who picks up your CV. Perhaps suddenly they might have another job in, like, you know, you just really don't know. It's all about timing and follow it up with a phone call and making it short and snappy. They don't really care what you get up to in your spare time. You know, just making it obviously, you know, uh, trying to help them get a job. So a lot of students come to us and we try to help them and I've been successful so far and help quite a few people get jobs. And again, as Doug just says, it's absolutely saturated at the moment with jobs. And I also negotiated a few months ago a sort of part-time work arrangement with Oxford Archaeology where I do a week on and week off or three days a week. And you could never have done that a few years ago, but you could get away with that now. So, you know, you kind of, it's up to you to go out there and find it and do as much as you can and find what works for you and actually phone up the companies and talk to them. Don't just assume, yes, oh, this, they'll let me do this or they won't let me do this. You'll never know unless you've got the phone. Then phone them up before they even advertise. I, I mean, by the time a job goes on to Badger or now SIPA, um, <laughs> they've gone through their entire list of people, all the CVs they've had, they've already looked through, and they have no one left. And that's why they're advertising. Call up every company in your area. Badger has a list of how many? Oh, 267. Yeah. People who are hiring, a lot of people, they'll actually you have a better chance than sending in a random CV if they talk to you on the phone. And you can be like, yeah, you know, I have two months, but I'm a hard worker. And by the fact that you called shows that you are actually in the 90th percentile of archaeologists. I think, I mean, going off the subject of what we've been talking about, how to physically get a job, I'm seeing a lot of the comments that have been coming out here is, if, you know, if you want a job in archaeology, chase the job in archaeology, move around for the job in archaeology. And then I'm seeing your slides with the women in archaeology, and, and there's a lot of students, and there's not a lot of, lot of females in commercial archaeology. And I'm thinking, if I've got a kid, 
am I going to go to, you know, go, go and move miles and miles away across the country just for three months work? No, it's just not practical. For, and, and although we can kind of say to our students, yeah, okay, go and do this kind of thing, really stick your neck out there and go and chase this work, there is a contradiction in terms of what we're saying they ought to do in order to, to get the work, and then a contradiction between the quality of life that they're going to get if they're going to have to run around and do these kind of things. And I think that's, again, it's something people are not necessarily prepared for when they're doing their undergraduate. I don't think many people realise exactly how many years you have to dedicate to archaeology. I've certainly dedicated a lot of years and more money to archaeology than archaeology has yet to give me. Um, and I suspect it will always be that case. Um, and I wonder if that isn't a, a problem for our profession as, as professional archaeologists, that we are required to sacrifice an awful lot just to work in the field that we're interested in. I think a question I've got for all of you is, are archaeology degrees vocational degrees, or are they not vocational? Or should there be a split, and we should be offering some people leaving school the option of having a vocational degree, and some having a non-vocational degree? Does anyone have a view on that, Tom? So, um, yeah, this is something I was thinking about in the previous question, actually, when Lauren was talking. Um, you were saying that some, well, you, a lot of it, when universities do three-year degrees, I went to Edinburgh and we do four-year degrees, and that's because our students end high school earlier and are 17, I'm 17 for my first semester of university. Um, but what that allows you to do, and Edinburgh doesn't do, which is disappointing, is diversify at the end. I, I have a lot of friends who study engineering, they do five year degrees at Edinburgh. Um, but the last year of that, they get to do food engineering, or they get to do chemical engineering, or they get to do you know, structural engineering, or whatever. They can diversify, and that's, that includes things in the workplace. Why can't we have a four year degree where in the last year you are you can go and do field work and you can go and do a research project with an academic and you can go and work in a museum or in a lab or specialise with a product expert. Why do we not have those connections with specialists in numerous degrees so that we're not enforcing field work people who don't want to do field work and vice versa? University of Winchester. That? Almost every other university does that in every other um, field, but just not archaeology. Yeah, I think that's that is something that I'm definitely considering like kind of on my last slide and everything and that's kind of what some of the students that had raised that because I've not actually thought about that before and it was some students having talked to on Facebook that actually brought that up um, and yeah I think it is something that we should definitely consider certainly um, but the, the thing I know that David is saying about like vocational degrees and things like that the only thing that I think I have to be very careful of is that there's already this sort of massive divide between kind of the commercial sector and then the academic research thing. I think if we start going down a route of uh, degrees and then vocational things as well, um, I think that we do run a risk of making that divide even wider. Because I mean, the, the, the recent announcement by the Chancellor that they're going to extend the student loan schemes now to postgraduates would, would actually allow, I mean, the courses were probably tailored, that you could actually do a four year degree on the same basis as the first one. Maybe, as you say, the last year could actually be a master's or, or a specialist in archaeology. Um, but, but what I really want to say was um, uh, coming back to my question about apprenticeships, that this, this just worries me so much, you know. Um, and David, David will know about this because we've been discussing it on Badger. There have been two apprenticeships in, in the last couple of weeks advertised, and one thing that these apprenticeships actually ex exclude is anyone who's already got a higher qualification. And, and, and to kind of offer that the, the industry might be able to offer your way in for an apprenticeship, where in fact 90% of the people that are coming in in the industry will be excluded because they've already got a degree, seems to me to be a little bit of a kind of papering over the cracks, really. And, and, and that leads me on then to uh, the presentation last week at the IFA where, where one of the managers of the units that are offering these kind of uh, these entry schemes um, you know, proudly showed us that in fact the qualifications they've put in their job advert were in effect O levels to get into, into uh, an interview for this job. But the fact was at the end of the day, having advertised a job where you only needed O levels, they only took on graduates. You know, again, that seems to me to be a little bit of a con, really, in, in trying to suggest that we're opening the field to a wider range of people, but then, in fact, the number of people that are coming in it is actually much the same as it was before. And then that brings me on to graduate training schemes, where, in effect, you work for a long time for less than the other people, but you're doing the same work. And it's the same charge-out rate. You know, that man from so-and-so housing, He's paying the same amount for this archaeologist being in the field as he's paying for somebody that's qualified. You know, and where's that difference going? Because it isn't going into very much training. I mean, some of these training schemes need a bit of money to set themselves up, but then they become self-perpetuating. 
You know, they, they don't need any additional materials, any additional supervision, and it's getting, they'd be getting anywhere as a supervisor. So, so I think there are some dangers there. And I, I don't think that the industry has been able to kind of grab, I know David tries its best, but I don't think we, we've actually realized what we might be letting ourselves into. And the final point is, when I asked uh, the chat from Worcester, not so much about training new people to come into the industry, what were they doing about trying to bring back some people who were already trained and experienced that we lost in the last recession that would like jobs? Nothing. You know, that basically, that is the lost generation. We've already written off people. And what I don't want to see is that we're taking people on now, and in a couple of years' time, we're writing them off again. And then just saying, oh, give us fresh meat, you know? But all of you people that we've promised this sort of future to, you can just go by the by, like the last generation, like the generation before that. I think I'm aware, I'll, I do want you all to have a break, so uh, I don't want to get you know, too protracted, so I'm just going to let you two have a, a comment each, uh, and then it will have to be a break, so just have another two minutes. Okay. The biggest problem with the labour market for archaeologists is that our companies are led by archaeologists, who are, with a personal uh, history, uh, are and the, the cult of suffering, we all had to go through hard times to, to get that job, are full of good intentions. I don't doubt it about it, but they don't see the trading perspective. I'm not a real manager, but pick up one or two books on management style and the modern management style, and you see archaeological companies do it all to a certain extent wrong. I don't know anyone who has a good, uh, especially the bigger, and if it's in the Netherlands, it's in, it, it was in Ireland, it is how the French street or staff, it is Yes, we are doing archaeology and we try to be as professional as possible as archaeologists in human resource management. Uh, things with, with uh, uh, working conditions, etc, etc, etc. We are too eager to do archaeology and that forms our profession. That's, that's well, the root of many a well, economic and social problem. And as long as we continue to do this and we see this as a career perspective for ourselves, well, we perpetuate this thing because these things have been discussed in uh, the 1950s in, uh, in the United States, it has been said before the crisis, it has been said during the crisis, and things are not changing, and perhaps that's the reality of the job. Do you have a comment to finish? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to say that it's, we, I, we probably all know this, but we are not talking about the fact that because we have a degree, uh, about to have a degree in archaeology, means that we actually have to do archaeology. That the skills that we uh, gain are so broad that we can actually do anything we want. And statistics show that uh, people that study humanities, they are more likely to gain also other skills, like economic skills and stuff like that. So I feel like we should be looking in a broad way and not just commercial archaeology or uh, what, whatever we are looking at. We should be even like something like, I don't know, journalism, because all the papers, all the essays that we write, it's crazy. So we like seriously. We have so many skills that we can actually do more than what we are looking at. I think this is certainly a multi-stranded issue, and bear in mind that in this session so far we've only really touched on employment, and that's only one aspect of being a student in archaeology. So I'm going to give you a break now.